Well, I have a very special guest today, Dr. Kevin Wagner from Wagner Ministries International. He is a great evangelist, but he also happens to be a great father. And so today we're going to be talking about the evangelist and his family. Welcome, Dr. Kevin Wagner. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Daniel. It's great to be on the show. And we're going to talk about families. It's very important for evangelists to take their family into consideration as they're called to go around the world and preach the gospel. They also need to take care of their family. And so I think a great biblical example is Philip the evangelist. He's the only one in the entire Bible who was specifically called an evangelist. And we find his story in, in Acts, the uh, 20th chapter. It, yeah. Or 21, maybe? Yeah, I think 21. We find his story in Acts chapter 21 when Luke and Paul stop in Caesarea. It says in, in Acts 21 verse 8, it says, Leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea and stayed at the house of Philip the Evangelist, one of the seven. And he had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. Amen. So the city of Caesarea was built by Herod the Great as a gift to Caesar in Rome. And it was a port city. And of course, sailors are coming into Caesarea and sailors, they cuss like sailors, they act like sailors, they're sinful. There are remnants of, of pagan temples that are built there in Caesarea. So this was a very sinful city. And I think that's a great place for an evangelist to go and live. Absolutely. So Philip the evangelist, he goes and lives in Caesarea and he's got four unmarried daughters. They're all virgins mm -hmm. and they prophesy. So they're working with him in the ministry and they've managed to keep themselves pure Amen. in a city where there is great sin. So Dr. Kevin, you have four sons mm -hmm. and they're, they've all grown up loving God. What did you do as an evangelist to raise your family and, and keep them close to God? It's a great question, Daniel. You know, I, uh, I looked actually to Philip the evangelist when we start our ministry as an example. And then of course the other modern day men of God who have raised their families in my estimation very well. And I tried to learn from those examples and I remember early on, Billy Graham, the great evangelist, he said in response to the question that someone asked him towards the end of his life, uh, do you have any regrets? And he said this He said this one thing I remember. He said, I wish I would have spent more time with my family when they were young. And that was those are words that really impacted me as a uh, young evangelist, just starting out. And so I really made my best effort to, uh, when I was not traveling, to really be at home and present with the kids. In other words, not just at home, kind of doing work while I was at home and, and, and uh, asking them to leave me alone to do some private work, but rather if I was at home, I think I I'm be guilty playing. of that sometimes. <laughs> I was busy today and told both my kids, I'm daddy's busy, let me work. <laughs> well, I mean, there are times for that. But as much as possible, I always tried to, if I was not traveling, I would try to be present with them. Yeah. And, uh, and that would be, that was, I think, a big priority. So I think I kind of learned from Billy Graham that way, because it's like, if, he, if that's a regret that he had, I, I wanted to, you know, try to avoid that pitfall. I think, now, now you have four sons. Tell, right. tell us about your four sons. You've got Josh. Okay. You've got Jesse. Yeah. yeah. You've got... Uh, Daniel. Daniel and Luke. That's right. So got four sons and we um, so Josh he works with me in our ministry uh, he's a full-time evangelist with Wagner Ministries International and we um, you know we have a lot of the same skill set and and uh, we work together really well. So he really preaches well. he, yeah. he, he goes and does crusades same as you? That is exactly right in fact we have never since he was uh, 18 years old been together on the same crusade <laughs> We've Someday, always been separate. <laughs> what you need is a father-son crusade where you get to go and, and... But, of course, the Bible does say if you've... Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, right. so... <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, that's so if you've seen Josh, right. you've seen Dr. Kevin. Yeah. 
Well, you know, I've had a lot of father-son crusades in the past because here was here was what what I did when I was when the boys were growing up is I uh, because the places that we went were literally on the other side of the planet. There's a huge time change. First of all, there's a huge travel involved, which you understand, Dr. Daniel, because you go to the same places. You know, it takes via planes, trains, and automobiles. It takes uh, the better part of often two days to get to where we're really going, the ultimate destination. And so uh, that sort of travel is very grueling physically. It takes a t its toll on a body. And so I didn't want to take my kids when they were too young. The other thing is, because it's on the other side of the planet, it's a time change of, you know, really night is day and day is night. Uh, it's 10 to 12 hour time change in many cases. And so it's really hard because you're, you're tired when you're supposed to be fully awake ministering and then you're really awake when you're supposed to be tired in the middle of the night so those things made it very clear to me that I wanted to wait until my boys were at least 13 years old or right around there to begin taking them along with me even though they were eager to go even at a younger age so all of my boys started traveling with me when they were around 13 years old that was uh, a time when they became very adventurous like most teenage boys are and uh, they were happy to come. It wasn't ever anything I forced them to do either. It was just something that I, I asked them and they were always interested in doing it. That's a great adventure for the children of an evangelist to go to the mission field. And, and some people stay at home and play video games. They get to go <laughs> and, and ride in a rickshaw. It's great fun. You know, uh, my wife, Nicole, she homeschooled the kids. Uh, homeschooling is a popular choice for a lot of ministry families, not just evangelists. And so uh, the homeschooling allowed us the flexibility for the boys to do these sorts of things. And, and starting to travel on those crusades was the first thing that I gave them an opportunity to do. But then when they became 15 years old, after they traveled with me for about two years, I then invited them to start teaching at their own youth conferences. Over in these countries, uh, youth ministry, ministry specifically to teens, is very, very rare. Uh, it's something that, do, that most churches do not uh, have a lot of focus and stress on like we do over in North America. And so to have a teen conference for the teens of that city was, was groundbreaking in a lot of these places, especially because a lot of these places are off the beaten track. So I would ask my boys, hey, you've been watching me preach now on these crusades for, you know, a few times for a couple years. Would you like to teach at your own teen conference? And of course, invariably, they said, yeah, I'd like to. And um, so when they were 15, they started getting up in front of, you know, oftentimes hundreds of teens, local teens in these other countries, and they would start preaching and they would start teaching and they'd start ministering, laying their hands on people to be saved, delivered and healed by Jesus. And so at 15 years old, they started doing the stuff of evangelism. Wow, that's tremendous. So, so I, I've heard you say three things. First of all, be intentional about spending time with your kids as they're growing up. And then two, allow the children to travel with you. And then three, give them opportunities to minister. You, you know, I'm a, I'm a big believer that God does not just call individuals. He calls families. Absolutely. He's a generational God. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, yep. and Jacob. And so God doesn't look just at the individual. He, he looks at the entire family, and he has a mm -hmm. destiny for the entire family to be involved in his, his plan for humanity. And, and so my grandparents were missionaries, mm -hmm. and then my parents were also missionaries. Amen. And so I was privileged to grow up on the mission field and to be part of our family was to be part of the ministry. And so I got to participate in my father preaching and, and we would go into Mexico and do lots of small mm. children's crusades. Yes. And I was the one in charge of putting up the sound <laughs> system and putting yeah. out the chairs and, and passing out beans and rice. I was the slave labor of the ministry. I worked hard <laughs> and stuffing newsletters wow. to, to raise money. And so that's how I grew up. As a, as a child, but I loved it. Mm -hmm. Just the opportunity to participate in the ministry. And, and now, of course, I'm an evangelist and I'm training my kids. My yeah. son, Caleb, is now 10 and my daughter, Katie Grace, is eight. And they've been on several missions trips with us. 
and Katie loves praying with people. Yeah. Uh, we did a, a women's conference last year in Dominican Republic, and Katie got up and sang with my wife as a special Praise for all the God. women, and it was anointed. They, yes. uh, the presence of God fell when she was singing. Mm -hmm. and, and then my son was helping to, to run the camera. Amen. Which I had been praying and asking God, say, God, I need a camera person to travel with me. Yeah. And my son was enthusiastic about running the camera, and he took it very seriously and, and was capturing the footage of all the miracles and the things that, that God did. And, and so you intentionally included your, your children in the ministry, and, and how has that now produced fruit in their lives? Yeah, so I've mentioned my son Josh uh, already, but my second son Jesse, uh, he is in full-time ministry down uh, in an excellent church, a large uh, church in the Dallas, Texas area. He's a director of student, one of the directors of student ministries down there, a uh, student ministries pastor. They have just an incredible student ministry, a very large student ministry, dynamic and influential. And uh, he's got a, a real a real great ministry that God's using him uh, in down there. My other two sons, Daniel and Jess, are Daniel and Luke. Uh, Luke is getting his master's degree at Oral Roberts University right now in biblical studies. Both Daniel and Luke uh, got their bachelor's degrees uh, in biblical studies from ORU. And so they're still kind of figuring out exactly what, uh, what God wants them to do in terms of the calling of their life. But both of them are strong believers in Jesus, love the Lord, and are active in their local churches. Now, one of the things that, that you did with your sons that I really love was Bible quiz. Hmm. And you memorized scripture with them and then it participated in, in Bible quizzes. Uh, how did that come about and, and what happened with being in Bible quiz? Well, that was something we just kind of stumbled into. Or we should, I should say God ordained it because that was not part of our paradigm uh, growing up in Canada, we didn't have a really developed Bible quiz ministry the way that the U.S. has in some parts, especially here in Oklahoma. And so, when when our boys, when our oldest son got to be about 15, uh, his friends invited him to join this Bible quiz program at the church that they are in a youth group of. And the boys found out that they were not only really good at memorizing scripture, but they're also really good at quizzing generally. And Bible quiz is kind of like I say, it's kind of like. Um, a Bible version of Jeopardy, but it's really well organized and very competitive down here uh, in the Assemblies of God that we that we um, quizzed with. And so, our boys ended up being uh, you have a team of three three to six people, and they ended up being like the most successful Bible quiz team in the history of Bible quiz down here since the 60s. And I coached them. Uh, my wife Nicole also assistant coached them, and then the boys were the quizzers. And so we did this as a family, and some of their friends joined the team too, and. All it did was it placed the Word of God in their hearts, just like the Bible says. So they were memorizing entire books of the Bible, yeah. and then you memorized it along with them right. just to help quiz them yeah. and coaching them to, to do very well with, with Bible quiz. What a tremendous way to, to hide God's Word Well, I mean, hearts. the nice, the fun thing about it is, you know, boys generally, teenage boys are competitive by nature, and so this Bible quiz was really competitive and so this was kind of like their sport we played it like a sport and even though we played other sports for fun this is kind of our competitive thing and the boys just were super good at it and you know all all four of the boys have memorized like you said literally uh, entire books of the New Testament uh, some of the boys have memorized three Gospels like three not like thousand, you know over a thousand verses in some of these books I memorized 19 books of the, of the New Testament, uh, mainly the smaller books, but uh, each of us have memorized literally thousands of verses of the New Testament. And I quote, on the way over here to your house today to do the podcast, I was quoting through um, the book of Acts, just driving along. What chapter are you on in the book of Acts? Well, today I was just, I kind of started, I, qu I quoted like the end of Ju the God book of Jude, and then I went into Acts, and so I was quoting into Acts 1 and 3, I think. 1, 2, and 3. Wow, that's tremendous. So let's talk more about raising kids as an evangelist. Sure. You know, it would be a great tragedy to lead thousands of people to Jesus mm -hmm. and to have one of your own kids fall away from Christ right. and not, not make it to heaven. So, so what priority do you think the evangelist should put on raising children and on their family? 
Well, obviously, I, th I would say this, that, that the priority of your family first, over ministry even, uh, is, is paramount. It, it needs to, your family needs to be taken care of first. And you know, the Bible says that if you don't do that, you're worse than a pagan. You're worse than an unbeliever. And, and they're not just talking physical needs there, they're talking emotional and spiritual uh, or, and physical needs. And uh, so you need to put your family, uh, prioritize, prioritize them first. I think for me, one of the uh, things, one of, in the progression of giving people an opportunity, my family an opportunity to see what God's call was on their life. You know, when they, I mentioned how when they were 15, they started doing their own teen conferences. But when they became 18 years old, Dr. Daniel, then I invited them if they wanted to, and all of them said that they wanted to, and they did. If they wanted to, they could start doing their own crusades in these countries. And I wouldn't go with them. Their mom went with them. My wife, Nicole, would go with them. But they would start literally preaching at the, teaching at the pastor's conferences and doing the crusade meetings in front of all these people. Now, they'd already been seeing all these things modeled for them for five years. Why did I do this? I did not do this in an attempt to try to impose God's calling on their life. Because I was very clear from the start with the boys, I want you to do what Jesus has called you to do. When we see, sometimes we see ministers trying to impose a calling on their children that just because they're, they were called to be a, uh, in this type of ministry, then their kids should be too. And it doesn't usually work out well. It may seem to work out well for a short time, but in the long run, it doesn't seem to work out well. So I was very cognizant of that. And so what I wanted to do was simply show them what the life and calling of an evangelist is like and to help them make an informed decision as they became older what God wanted them to do with their life. So at least they knew what, uh, what they would be getting themselves into if they said yes to God's call to be an evangelist, if that was what he wanted. And so far out of my four kids, uh, one of them is an evangelist along with me. One of them is a, in full-time ministry as a pastor at a large thriving church. And the other two are still discerning God's call in their life. But the bot, and who knows, maybe all of them worked for our ministry, Dr. Daniel, into their 20s. They were all doing crusades for our ministry into their 20s. And then as time went on, some have stayed with it, some haven't, but it doesn't mean they're not serving the Lord. They're just going with what they believe God's calling them to do for the season of life. And who knows, some of them may transition into evangelism again like I did later on in life. That's tremendous. What, what, a, what a great blessing that is. What, what more advice would you give to an evangelist who has young children? So, so your son Josh, mm -hmm. he, he now has uh, three kids and one more on the way. Uh, that's right. And, and uh, so, so what advice are you giving to your son Josh as he starts to raise your grandchildren? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I think I would say this, that schooling is a big issue. We talked about Bible quiz. We talked about how I think, you know, honestly, in terms of hobbies and time that you spend your time, things that you spend your time on with your children and teenagers, I don't think there's any better hobby than Bible quiz because it gets the word of God into your heart. And it says, Bible says, how can a young man keep his way pure by living according to your word? I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Now, having said all that, I think that another hugely important thing is, um, and my wife and I have taught parenting conferences occasionally through the years, and, and one of the things that we say too that's really big is, is how are you going to school your kids? Um, obviously, the type of schooling that you do with your kids is also, we believe, a calling from God. We're not saying that everyone needs to homeschool, even though we did. We're not saying everyone needs to put their kids in a private Christian school, even though uh, at this point your kids are, Dr. Daniel. Yeah, my, my kids are at, at Victory School, and we decided to put them in there because they have chapel twice a week. They right. memorize scriptures. The teachers yeah. pray over them, uh, lead them in devotions every day. And so we wanted our kids to Amen. be in an atmosphere of, of learning about God rather than a, a secular atmosphere. And then the other option typically, at least in North America, is public schooling. And depending on the school district, uh, there are still some school districts, I know especially in Oklahoma, that uh, they, they run their schools very much like Christian schools still. 
you know, and they have their kind of throwbacks in that whole uh, public school system. But if you choose the public school route, I think you really need to feel called by God to do that uh, because what's increasingly happening in our culture in the U.S. and Canada is, of course, that God has not just been really kind of expelled from school, <laughs> but, uh, but the enemy and many of the enemy's teachings and, and world views have been invited in to replace that vacuum. And so you really need, I think, if your kids are going to be in the public school system, you want to have them um, as, you want to give them a mindset of being a missionary whenever they go to school. That they're entering, you know, the largest mission field in North America on a daily basis. And um, so I think that you've got, you've got those three main decisions to make when it, term, when it comes to schooling your kids, especially when your kids start, you know, getting to the age of kindergarten and beyond. So that's really huge. You know, you gotta, gotta get on your knees. Gotta fast and pray. God, what do you want me to do with my kids? What do you, they're your kids ultimately. They're on loan from you. What do you want me to do with your kids? Yeah. Well, let's finish up today with advice from Paul to Timothy, who is one of his spiritual sons. In 1 Timothy 3, he's talking about what an ideal bishop mm -hmm. would look like who is called to to lead people in the body of Christ and even though this is written to a bishop I think it applies to an evangelist as well verse 2 of, of 1st Timothy chapter 3 it says now the the overseer or the bishop must be above reproach the husband of but one wife temperate self-controlled respectable hospitable able to teach not given to drunkenness not violent but gentle not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. And so all that is good. But specifically about a family, he says he must manage his own family well. Yes. And so I think that is excellent advice to the evangelist. You have to learn to, to manage your own family well. That's exactly right. And I think just to quickly say one more thing about word of advice for how to raise your kids, especially when they're younger, not just as an evangelist family, but but as a as a Christian family, you want to be on top of the media that media that they're involving themselves with, and so uh, you want to make very sure that you're doing what you can as a parent to monitor uh, internet usage and uh, what they're listening to, what they're um, uh, watching, etc. Uh, not in an in an intrusive way, but in a uh, in a responsible way because you want to try to do what you can to help them to be exposed to godly stuff instead of the other. Uh, I think this chapter in 1 Timothy 3 about overseers and deacons is just incredible, Dr. Daniel. I mean, yes, uh, you need to manage your own family well and a big part of that is being on the same page with your wife in terms of uh, child rearing, child raising and um, if there's you know discrepancy there, you want to talk things through. You certainly didn't raise your kids alone. Your wife <laughs> absolutely has done an excellent <laughs> job. In fact, she probably gets a lot of the credit for sure thing. You raising bet. four boys that love Jesus. Yes, amen. I think too the other thing that that we did as a family. God told me in 1996 when my boys were still all pretty young. I remember coming back from Atlanta, Georgia. We were out doing a, an outreach during the, the pre-Olympic days in Atlanta. And on the way home, the Lord spoke to me and says, get your house in order. And I said, God, I thought I already had it in order. He says, no, there's, there's something you need to do. And I came home because God had told, told Nicole about this. He said, we got to start having a family, um, daily quiet time as a family. And so from 1996 on, right up until the boys really, for the most part, left for university and moved out, uh, we did daily quiet times with the boys. And I don't mean we just kind of did daily quiet. I mean, you could pretty much count on both hands in one year how many days we didn't do quiet time as a family together. You know, and what does that mean? It means that you sit down with them, you, uh, you read a chapter of the Word of God, you talk about that, you hear what they, talk, they learned about in their own daily devotions, you pray together, you speak in tongues together. Um, it's, it doesn't have to take a super long amount of time, but it's a time of your day where you focus your attention as a family on Jesus and what the Bible has to tell us about him. And I think looking back on our, uh, on our family, the single most important thing that Nicole and I did as parents 
was maintain that daily quiet time with our boys regularly, consistently, and over a long period of time. In our family, we do nightly Bible stories. Amen. And so they're at the age where they love hearing Bible stories. And so we have a series of, of Bible story books that, that I read to them. And usually I'll, I'll read one or then they like ask for another one yes. and then they ask for another one. <laughs> so we usually end up reading like three or four yes. stories and finally I'm like, okay, you have to go to bed now. <laughs> They'll use any excuse they yeah. can to not actually go to bed. Right. And so they're like, read one more, read one more. And, and, and so that's been fun. And then even more recently, we've started to read through the Chronicles of Narnia, yes. which has some great spiritual truths in it. It's Absolutely. fun. So we'll read a couple of Bible stories and I'll read a couple chapters of Chronicles mm -hmm. of Narnia. And then we'll talk about the, the, the different spiritual principles that are in those chapters. And so that's been great fun. It's so good. So, well, thank you for sharing about how you raised your boys to love Jesus, Dr. Kevin. Uh, it's been a pleasure uh, to talk about those things with you, Dr. Daniel. God bless you. Daniel King is on a mission to save one million souls a year, but he can't do it alone. Would you consider sowing a financial seed today? To give, please visit www.kingministries.com.